Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Andy McAfee. I'm a scientist at MIT, and I am the moderator today for our session on mobilizing a reskilling revolution. I believe on the screen we will see some housekeeping notes. Please be aware of those. And please be aware also that the urgency of this task has only gone up. On our pre-call, we were re reminded that this reskilling initiative was launched just nine months ago in January at Davos, and we already had a sense of urgency about it. And then, as everyone here is acutely aware, the world changed, and the COVID global pandemic and recession hit, and the need to reskill large numbers of people around the world in shorter amounts of time uh, has become abundantly clear to everybody. Luckily, we have a fantastic panel today to help us think through these issues. Unfortunately, we only have 45, 45 minutes total for those of us who came in via top link, and the first 30 minutes will be globally live streamed to everybody. So we are tight on time given the amount of good ideas out there and the amount that we have to cover. So one of my jobs will be to act as kind of a ruthless timekeeper. And I ask everybody's forgiveness in advance for that. We have a fantastic group of people to help us think through these issues. We have Peter Hummelgaard, who is the Minister of Employment for Denmark. Manish Kumar, who is the Managing Director of the National Skill Development Corporation of India. Shireen Yakub, who is the Chief Executive Officer of EDROC for Training and Social Development in Jordan. Henrietta Four, who is the Executive Director of UNICEF in New York. Jeff Maggioncalda, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Coursera. And Robert Moritz, who is the Global Chairman of PWC. Um, Peter, if we could start with you, could you please help us understand what you've learned via the pandemic and the response to the pandemic in Denmark and what, it's, what, what you're learning about reskilling um, via this troubling period? Well, thank you so much, Andy, and also thank you uh, to uh, the whole of the forum for this invitation uh, to uh, really been looking forward to this session. I think, uh, first of all, uh, I, I think it's, it's very, very vital for me to stress that uh, I think it's very imminent that all countries, and that is what also what we've been doing in Denmark, is that we use our knowledge and experience to get out of the COVID-19 pandemic and, uh, and into creating a better future. And uh, we've been trying to set goals during the crisis handling, where we tried to see that we want to, uh, to handle a crisis in a way that, uh, that creates a more fair society, a better social contract between the individual and the society. And also, and especially uh, and notably for this session, that workers have the right skills for the jobs for tomorrow. In Denmark, we uh, obviously also face unemployment in, uh, in the uh, response uh, over the COVID-19 crisis. The Danish government is massively investing in education and upskilling so that the many people have lost their jobs can obtain new in-demand skills, giving them opportunities to adapt to new industries with labor shortage. Uh, in Denmark, uh, within the government, we have also reached two ambitious political agreements that strengthen the opportunities for upskilling and job-focused education for the many unemployed following the economic crisis of the pandemic. The agreements contain initiatives for a total sum of approximately 100 million euro over the coming years. And that is, uh, in a Danish context, a lot of money, I should be fair to say. <laughs> With the agreements, uh, Denmark will make clever use of the crisis by investing in people future-proofing the qualifications of the Danish workforce. The agreements introduced 13 ambitious initiatives covering a number of new efforts targeted all groups of the labor market, including and especially the unskilled, low-skilled, the skilled, the graduates, and also the entrepreneurs. Extraordinarily, uh, and that is, this is one of the, the, the key components in this strategy, is that unskilled workers and skilled workers with outdated training are granted a right to higher unemployment benefits if they begin a vocational education of in-demand skills. And that's meaning skills for industries with high potential for subsequent employment during the pandemic and even after the pandemic. And uh, concretely, that means that we pay 
a 110% in unemployment benefits for those with insufficient skills today to begin an education with uh, in uh, in demand uh, for in demand jobs. Also, we have fo we also obviously have to focus on the youth unemployment. Uh, we can see that in the statistics, those who have been hit hardest by the uh, uh, crisis following the pandemic is the unskilled workers, but also youth in general. So both young and more experienced can draw new life tracks, get a new job if the old one disappears, and therefore we try to educate for the future. And I'm grateful that we in Denmark have made a tripartite agreement on apprentices. It keeps the hand under Danish apprenticeships and makes it financially possible also for companies in difficulty to employ more apprentices in internships. And also, of course, to hold on to the students and apprentices businesses already have. And that's what we try to keep it up. No doubt, we will need more skilled workers in the future. I believe uh, that all of the responses that we have tried to make uh, following the pandemic has been on a very, very strong involvement of the social partners in all areas of the labor market. And also this has been key to us that they are a key for the development and more equal and fairer labor markets. During the COVID-19- Peter, if you could wrap up. Yeah, sure. And just to, to wrap it up, uh, during the, the pandemic, what we have done is that we have had a very strong emphasis on, as I mentioned, tripartite agreements, and we have tried to, so to say, uh, broaden the responsibility to all sectors of society uh, in uh, handling on, not only the reskilling revolution, but also the economic responses. Thank you for your attention. Peter, thank you. And again, I apologize for being rude. It's just that we have an extremely tight timeline. Uh, Shireen, I'd like to turn to you. Uh, learning has become more virtual and more remote. In many cases, just about 100% overnight, much more quickly than we were expecting. Can you talk about what you've learned via this really abrupt transition and what you think the new normal for online education might look like as we transition hopefully quickly out of this pandemic? Thank you, Andrew and uh, Sadia and uh, the team for giving me the opportunity to share our insights. Uh, so online learning can play a huge role in upskilling and uh, I believe it's the most powerful lever we have to speed uh, skilling at scale. Uh, in the future of jobs report that was just released yesterday, we see that one in two people uh, of workers have to reskill and those who remain at their jobs need to update 40% at least of their skills. And this needs to be happening now. Uh, they cannot drop uh, uh, everything and go back to uh, campus. Uh, we cannot wait for yet another year or two to help them reskill. As Sadia was uh, saying in our uh, uh, pre-session, uh, that the, the window of uh, uh, acting and the opportunity to act is becoming much, much uh, smaller and fast and the need to, for solutions are much faster. So uh, for example, uh, globally, there has been a fourfold increase in online learning that is of uh, people's own initiative. And we've seen this uh, first had at DRAC. Uh, we've seen an increase of 1 million new learners joining the platform in less than five months, a 400% growth uh, in comparison to previous years. We've seen how online education has helped sustain learning in the MENA during lockdowns and uh, curfews. So uh, I, I believe that with this cost-effective, scalable uh, solution that allows for iteration, that leverages big data, that provides just-in-time opportunities for uh, workers to reskill, we have have a huge opportunity but equally important is the question of how can we actually leverage online learning to address this pandemic and uh, the challenges brought about uh, so there are four key components and i'll go through them really quickly uh, for the interest of time the first is collaboration we really need to make sure we have coherent uh, efforts going together from the public sector, private sector and civil society joining efforts uh, to make sure that um, we are leveraging all resources that are available and providing the investments needed 
to uh, launch this uh, skilling revolution. And also we need to have some uh, global standards guiding the design and implementation of these programs. Uh, we're working now with the web on the global taxonomy and as part of the skills consortium. Uh, three, we need more investment in the edtech sector. It was actually just identified as one of the 20 uh, new markets and sectors that can have the potential to help us with recovery. Uh, and uh, we need more expansion in the definition of uh, uh, basic internet as a human right to include better access to high speed internet so that they can more people can engage and we leave no one behind. It's critical that the private sector also uh, endorses the credentials or alternative credentials that the system offers because that will signal the value in the market and gives the certificates or this new certification schemes uh, um, some currency in value. And this will enhance the uptake among workers, but also perhaps promote entrepreneurship and support entrepreneurs uh, and encourage them to start investing more in this uh, sector. So there is no silver bullet here, but uh, we really, through um, a purposeful leadership and proactive collaboration, we can join efforts together to turn this pandemic and crisis into an opportunity to reset. And uh, this can only be done uh, uh, through collaboration. And uh, we just have to remember throughout uh, this whole process, the human at the center of it all. Uh, and the time is to act now. The cost of not doing so is just too high. Fantastic, thank you for that. Um, Robert, I'd like to turn to you and ask you a fairly similar question. Both you and I would imagine many of PwC's clients again, have huge reskilling needs, probably more acute ones than you were anticipating just nine months ago. And at the same time, your ability to deliver training and education to these people in person has very close to vanished. How are you at PwC dealing with that? And what have you learned? What have you shifted about the way you think, provide, you, the way you think about providing skills to your team? Andy, thanks very much for the question. The business community, PwC included that, has a tremendous responsibility in this area, and I'll break it down into four pieces. First, as you said, every business cannot guarantee employment, and they can't protect all the jobs they have, but they do have an obligation, an obligation to the employees, today's employees and tomorrow's, and to the communities in which they live. So they've got to actually step up and deliver what I'll call the upskilling at their individual institutions and help society understand what needs they have going forward. At PwC, we've spent a tremendous amount of time in what we call new world, new skills, mm -hmm. making sure our people are upskilling, not only to create new processes, new procedures, new technologies, but also adopt them and adopt them such that the workflow changes and making sure that is top of mind for all of our business leaders around the world is of paramount importance. This goes back to the role every single business can play. But the second role business can play is the fact that this is a very crowded agenda. The reality is every government is worried about how do I actually, can I think about the debt on my balance sheet now? To what money do I need to develop and distribute vaccines? We've got to make sure that the business community raises its voice in terms of making sure our government officials and other stakeholders involved in this conversation to keep the priority super high. The third point for businesses like us is what can you do to contribute? The Future of Jobs report points to the fact that the only way we get this done is the public-private partnerships. The business community has got to help deliver in three areas, help with what it takes to connect people, help people have the hardware necessarily to do that connection. And third, make sure that we've got the content to deliver and we're teaching teachers how to teach in a remote and distant way. And last but not least, Andy, is how do we make sure there's accountability in the system? The WEF has worked with the International Business Council to talk about reporting, which talks about what are we doing to contribute to the cause. That gets to the issue of demonstrating progress and comparability, and it puts the accountability back on the business community and our government leaders to move forward in the public-private partnership that there. Great opportunity of which now PwC is trying to play in all of those four pieces, both for our own employees, what we're doing to help our clients, and for that matter, what can we do to collaborate with others like you're going to hear for a second from Henrietta around the public-private partnership, what we're doing with GenU, and some of the stuff that we're doing with the Economic Forum. 
Great. Bob, that was actually so concise that we've got time for a little bit of a follow-up. Can you talk internally, uh, what have you learned about how to keep delivering skills to a large global workforce that really can't get together in person nearly as much? Has this thrown a wrench into it or can you still be effective here? The good news, Andy, for us, we've actually been on our, up, our own upskilling, our digital IQ enhancement over the last four years. So we actually made that transition pretty quickly and fairly well and consistently. But here's what it required. It required our leaders to create capacity in the system to give people time to learn. It required us to give them content as well. And content was not an assigned classroom at a given point in time. It was continuous. Some self-study, some classroom, now virtual classroom, and some was on the ground, in this case now in the team chat, in the Google Hangout, in whatever format we may be using ultimately. And it's got to be continuous, continuously throughout. The big challenge for organizations like us is how do you get more consistency of scale? The second learning I would tell you, Andy, is not just the learning to create the bot and the app. It's learning to adopt it, use it, and apply that thinking, that new skill to actually demonstrate there's a different process, a different value proposition, and these people will have more career opportunities going forward. It's all about how do we give them skills? How does it tie to their opportunities? And how can it be a win-win for them as individuals and a win-win for PwC as well? Reinforcing that in that crowded agenda, hugely important. Got it. Bob, thanks very much. Um, Henrietta, if we could turn to you, you and your organization are laser focused on, the op on providing opportunities to young people around the world. But those young people right now face this really bad one-two punch of a global recession and a pandemic that reduces their opportunities for in-person learning. So I'm wondering what you're observing about responses to that difficult situation. What new ideas are you and your team seeing and how are, how are young people around the world adapting, reacting and being supported during this time? Thank you very much, Andy. So uh, let me start with the WEF's report. So future of jobs, this should be a wake up call for all of us. And that's what we need to get out in the world so that every government, every school system begins to see this. Um, it's an urgent call for the future and what we can do about it. So may I, Andy, give you six ideas. So one is um, we really need to put skill building at the center of the modern education. Klaus Schwab has talked about this with the fourth industrial revolution, but we haven't done it yet globally. And it is a real area of anxiety for young people. Nine out of 10 young people were out of school during COVID, 1.6 billion of them. So you can't assume that they're getting it at school. So they need reading and mathematics, they need entrepreneurial skills because eight out of 10 in the lesser developed countries are gonna to have to make their own jobs. They also need occupational skills and they need digital skills. Second, we have got to shatter this digital divide. Half the world is not connected. So we have to reimagine education. And as Bob was just talking, at Generation Unlimited, and through a GIGA initiative, we are trying to connect every school in the world to the internet by the year 2030. This will change our world and give a chance to these young people. Um, we need to be sure that there's quality learning at the, and the training the teachers is baked into it so that there's a way to learn, it's modern. We also need to make it affordable. So we need IT, ICT companies who are willing to zero rate so that you can download learning materials for free. And I think we may have some on this panel who will help us. And we need devices for the young learners and we need to engage millions of young people to help other children learn. Uh, third area, Bob was very passionate and eloquent about public-private partnerships, but we really need them. So let me give you a couple of examples. Um, in Vietnam, SAP is leading tech companies who are rolling out digital learning to every student in Vietnam. That's 21.2 million of them and their learning skills. In Tajikistan, we've got a skills development, skills for work program that the government is putting in for secondary school and vocational training. And in Bangladesh, there is an apprenticeship program in which for six months, you can be an apprentice 
uh, with a company, you can learn skills. And right now at the end of that program, uh, they're 90% placement rate. So we're aiming for a million of these young people to get this. So this means you change skills. The other thing we've got to focus on is investing in girls and women. They are behind in the digital divide. Um, they, their skills are not up to what we need. So we have to focus on how to involve them. It also means because we need women, we need better paid leave in our offices. We need family friendly policies. Without it, the women won't have the time to be able to learn the new skills. And um, lastly, we really need to, to change these, these STEM careers so that they look appealing to women and to men and to young people. And they don't say, oh, that's too, too difficult. I don't want to do that. But we do want them to do that. This is an exciting future. They can all be part of it. So. It's a wonderful opportunity for the world right now. Everyone should read the WEF report. And we have a chance to reimagine education, reimagine skilling all over the world. Thank you, Henry. Henry. Thank you, Henrietta. And we actually have a little bit of time. I'm really pleasantly surprised to hear so many notes of optimism in your remarks. Am I hearing that correctly? You are. I mean, Bolivia, uh, in their school system, they put STEM training in for girls. They saw it was a big success, so they're not putting it in every school. So it changes how you think about skilling your country and the young of your country. It's a great investment. Fantastic. Thank you for that. And, and these notes of optimism are so welcome. Um, Manish, we'd like to turn to you. Uh, I, I cannot imagine the, the, the scale of the opportunities and the challenges that a country like India faces with respect to all these issues. Can you share some of your insights and learnings with us? Uh, thank you, Andrew. I think in the Indian context, in the normal time, uh, we would be running about 600 plus private partners would be running about 10,000 different institutes. And we would normally scale about 5 million people. And everything had to be shut in the uh, in end of March, actually. And then we expected that things would really get bad. But, but what we found is that the private sector uh, very quickly innovated. And uh, we, we could also adapt to their innovation. So over time, uh, we, we went digital uh, through our partners. Uh, and we would be able to at least cover half the distance that normally we did in a normal year, uh, which is quite large. Uh, we found that uh, we have a platform called League Skill India Platform where we have a lot of, uh, lot of courses out there. It's almost, uh, we have almost 5,000 different courses uh, with 20 different partners. And some of them are international partners. Almost 60% of them are free of cost. And we teach in nine different languages in 37 different sectors covering from maybe agriculture to aviation, to logistics, to tourism, hospitality, and all of these. So what we, felt, what we felt found was that uh, there's almost 22 times jump in the number of people who are learning online from February to what is now. Uh, so that's a huge jump that's, that's really occurred. And we strengthened that particular part and that we see as something which will morph into uh, a requirement in future too. It will become blended in my belief, uh, it will not remain completely online, but the demand for online has really, really picked up. And even schools and colleges and universities are looking for that and we are making partnership with them. Uh, secondly, we found that a lot of people actually lost their jobs. There were a huge amount of migration within the country people moving from one part to the other, and they lost the jobs. So we quickly adapted with the help of private sector again. And what's really happened there is we have got an electronic employment exchange now. And uh, just in about three months' time, we started that on 10th of July. And between then and now, we have been able to offer almost half a million jobs to people uh, to 800, through 800 different companies. And, uh, and that's, I think, something which we felt was very useful because Apart from skilling, it's very important to connect people to jobs. Uh, what we have used is AI-based um, algorithms at the back end. The idea being that people don't have to move too far away from their home places because there's so much of fear. And they are, they are very interesting innovation which private sector has done uh, that if somebody is coming for interview, the moment is near to the office, you get a, you get a message actually, uh, you get a signal in your mobile that they, the person is near uh, through, through a text message and you can actually begin adapting uh, your office to receive that person. So innovations which actually is helping despite mm -hmm. the COVID times. 
So we feel that uh, the future in that sense is moving uh, quite positively. Uh, one last thing is uh, that uh, to ensure that the institutes uh, can remain alive. Uh, we have been giving soft loans to them. We are also like a quasi, we are a semi-bank. I mean, we are more like a developmental bank. Uh, so we have given them working capital loans to ensure that they can tide over these difficult times. Uh, up to March of 2021, we are quite confident that we'll be able to pull through most of our training partners. But if it goes beyond that, it's going to be a challenge. Obviously, the government, as many of the previous speakers said, uh, though, despite their best efforts, would find it very difficult to put too much money on scaling at this point of time. Uh, but yet we have been able to manage quite a bit. So that's what I wanted to share. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, we are going to wrap up with you. You and your colleagues at Coursera have been saying for some time now that, uh, that learning and skilling uh, is at least digital centric, if not 100% digital, and that private for companies, for profit companies have an important role to play here. Uh, have all those ideas been reinforced during these COVID times? What, what are you learning? They have, Andy. I, I think the speakers so far, I've hit on a number of points, and you were asking, uh, you know, am I sensing some optimism among uh, with, with Henrietta among the panelists? I, I, there's a lot of optimism here. Now, clearly, the impact on lives and health, job opportunities that's been disparate by gender and by race here in America has been huge. But I think that there is a promise not uh, of, of more equal opportunity and greater opportunity, and not just a promise, but we're, all, we're really actually see, seeing progress um, in terms of how it's happening. So what I'll do is maybe talk about the, the design of what seems to be working, and I'll give a couple of examples. So one key part of the design of what's working is online learning platforms. Now, Coursera happens to be one, but take Coursera out of it for a sec. There is something about online platforms, whether it's eBay or whether it's Lyft or Uber, uh, whether it's Airbnb, the, the ability to aggregate lots of offerings in a place that is made then affordable to many people gives you the speed and the scale and the agility to solve complex problems. And I think Shireen nailed the speed and the scale. It also gives you collaboration. So on the platform, whether it's Coursera or others, you have educators who are universities on Coursera. We have 150 of them. We also have industry partners. We have IBM, we have Google, we have AWS, we have Facebook, we have Salesforce. They are creating job relevant skilling programs online that don't require a college degree and don't require any background in the field. So for those entry level digital roles, uh, you can learn the skills online. The credential comes from a known branded industry player. And, um, and what's also kind of neat since they're entry level roles and many of these digital roles are being available with remote work, the promise of online learning and remote work really creates an opportunity to learn and earn without having to leave your community. So I, I think there's a lot of promise there. We see great collaboration between universities and industry. So many universities are not only authoring courses, they're offering courses. So a university in India will offer courses from Duke on say negotiation and courses from, uh, fr from Google on being a data analyst. And the students in the university can take these courses. It counts towards a degree. So you still have a college degree, but that degree has really been enhanced by the content that's, that's available for both industry and educators. Uh, I will also mention uh, as, as an example of the speed and scale, what's possible. We had a situation here in the States where with respect to COVID contact tracing, just as an example of how fast we can move with collaboration and platforms, we had a case where the state of New York wanted to do COVID contact tracing. They approached Johns Hopkins University Within four weeks, they had authored a five-hour certified training course on COVID contact tracing. They put it on Coursera for free, directly to individuals and through institutions. Within four weeks, we had 400,000 people trained. We now have 800,000 people trained. And this is in the course of just a few months. So there really is a speed, scale, and agility. The final point that I'll just mention is the importance of bridging the digital divide. I think governments absolutely need to focus on connectivity like they focus on power and food security and clean water. Um, but there are a lot of things that, that institutions should be looking for. You, you really need to have a mobile piece. I mean, not everybody has a desktop computer. Not everybody has an internet connection at home. 
Not everybody has a private space to learn. Mobile is critical and offline is critical. You need to be able to learn on a mobile device and offline. And what we're now doing, we just announced at the Zoom Global Conference that you'll be able to record directly from Zoom into Coursera and then download a low data version of the course so that people who have limited access, limited data plans or limited income can actually get access to the content without having to spend so much money on the downloads and the digital connection. Fantastic. Uh, Jeff, thank you. And thank you to all of our panelists for being this amazing combination of concise, uh, clear and brilliant. I deeply appreciate it. This is going to mark the conclusion of our, lives, of our live stream. We are grateful to people around the world for joining us, and we hope this has been valuable for you. Thank you so much.